Hey everybody, welcome to Let's Talk Game Design. Uh, this is the Blaster edition of Let's Talk, where five of the world's best indie game designers get together. We're hosted by uh, Greg Horton, our august uh, graphic designer and marketing expert who's <laughs> part of the Blaster team. And we're gonna talk everything to do with game design. Um, all those topics you want, like to hear about and that five dudes who write tabletop games will talk about when they get together. Things like points or no points, um, alternating activation systems or I go, you go systems. Uh, the, the, just the various sort of like, uh, I guess, controversial topics or topics that come up. How do you become a game designer? What do you use when you write? How do you write? Uh, these are the things that we tend to chat about together and we thought we'd make a series out of it. So we're doing this live on Facebook uh, for folks to chime in on and I'll be restreaming this on my uh, YouTube channel as part of Let's Talk going forward. I've been struggling to find a way to do Let's Talk and this felt like a great way of doing it. Uh, and so I will give you a sort of parental advisory. Anything can happen in these shows, they are live. There might be some language you don't normally hear on GMG. Uh, so listener and viewer discretion is advised. Hey everybody, welcome hey. to Let's Talk Blaster. Uh, we are going to be live today with the first episode um, of our hopefully recurring roundtable of five indie game designers, all of whom have come together to make this great thing, Blaster. This is Blaster Volume 2. Uh, it's available now in the description if you want to check it out, um, about various topics in game design. So uh, it is going to be hosted here on Facebook on the Blaster page and also on GMG under the Let's Talk uh, sort of playlist as a, and also as a podcast, actually, as a recurring sort of like sit down where we pick something about game design. Uh, it could be a controversial topic like points or no points, or I go, you go systems versus alternating activations, or even just something as simple as like getting started writing a game. Uh, and the five of us all kind of have a go at it. We're going to be moderated by our good buddy, Greg Horton here, um, who is our editor and graphic designer for Blaster. And his job is mostly just to take notes and keep me from talking too much. So we're going to kick off this first one, um, and it's going to be all about uh, getting started writing a game. This is a topic we all get asked quite a bit, um, and it, it can take various forms like how do I become a game designer, or how do I actually physically write a game, or what do you need to have in front of you to write a game? And so we've all kind of put our thinking caps on um, and sort of thought about what we do ourselves and some stories about how that's affected the work we've made. And yeah, and we're going to share them with you guys today. So we'll be monitoring the chats a little bit to see what you guys are saying and maybe try and answer some questions and stuff too. But for the most part, I'm going to let Greg take it away uh, and kick the ball to one of these other great designers um, who I'll I have him introduced actually. Uh, and we'll get this started. So Greg, fire away. All right. So you've met Ash. He's a, he's a cool guy and also a designer of games. You're, <laughs> and then there's Mike Hutchinson designer of Gaslands, and there's Sean Sutter, designer of Relic Blade, and there's Joey, Joseph McGuire, designer of This Is Not a Test, and then there's Joseph McCullough, designer of Rangers of Shadow Deep and Frostgrave. And circling back to Ash, because I so rudely <laughs> blew his intro. Uh, <laughs> I designed Last Days and Gamma Wolves. Uh, Last and Days and Gamma that. Wolves. Last <laughs> Days and Gamma Wolves. There you go. Sweet. Um, so to get us started here, um, you know, basically we were all sharing this video of, of uh, the guy who wrote BFG, uh, Ronald Dahl, sitting in a shed with like a piece of paper. And he's like, I take six sharpened pencils and I haven't cleaned this shed since a goat took a couple of turkey turds onto the, the ground. And... I've only cleaned it that one time, and sometimes when it gets cold enough, I put on a uh, sleeping bag to keep my legs warm. So we're not talking about that kind of uh, how do you write. Uh, I'm, I think the best place to start is to how do you overcome a blank page? And I'm going to kick that, kick that over to McCullough first. The question yeah, can, is, are we going to sit down and write something? Most of the time, I think... Every writer experiences it at some point, but especially if you're sitting down to write it, something creative for the first time, you get that blank page that you're starting with. And it's just like the cursor's just flashing and you're like, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna write a game now. Like, how have you dealt with that? Um, well, I can't remember the very first time, I gotta admit, but, um, but I've gotten into a pattern of, so after I do my writing for the day, I either go for a bike ride or I go for a walk. 
And one thing I always try to do on that during that exercise is come up with what is my first line for tomorrow? Because if I can get that first line on the page, then just I feel like I'm already making progress. You know, you've already got some momentum when you're starting, and it's much easier to write a second line than it ever is to write the first. So, and, you know, even if you don't, you know, go for the exercise thing, just like if you're getting up in the morning, taking the shower, see if you can work out that first line in the shower before you get to the computer. Because I think that'll really help. And that's that's really helped me over the years. And then, uh, Sean, you're you're an artist. How does that take form on like a like on a drawing page? How do you get past it uh, when you're trying to? Yeah, I mean, I think there there's this like terrifying moment where like the immensity of things not existing until you start like that can like set in like a huge black cloud like there is nothing next unless i make it like that that can be pretty intense but um i think for me the the best method is breaking it down and and breaking it down into questions because i can answer questions it's harder for me to come up with it all at once but i can answer a question so it could be a rules question like like what happens when a, a volley of muskets shoot like what how does that play out in rules or it can be a lore question like how do like what are what traders exist in this city and like where's the marketplace or or all, all that kind of stuff, I can like answer questions. So if I think of, if I think of, well, what's the whole plot and theme and like, and I can kind of get somewhere, but if I break it down into smaller stuff, that really helps me. So um, asking and answering questions is really a big part of my process. Awesome. I like, it, and just a bit of writing advice for anyone. Uh, like I have a, for some reason, I have a bachelor's degree in writing. So, um, and one of the things that they taught us in creative writing was to just write something. So if you're ever stuck um, looking at that cursor, just write gibberish, you know, write about your day, write about, um, try to articulate any point whatsoever, or even just start writing, you know, like the ubiquitous, every thousand years, a hero is born you know, and just get it out on paper and then it's gone and it's out of your head. And now you can start your actual, your actual writing. Well, we were kind of getting started with that warm up question. We got a couple of uh, questions from the community. Um, one of them was, do you think it's easier to get a miniatures agnostic game published or one tied to a miniatures line? Is there a noticeable pressure for tie-in products from the folks that you work with? Well, I think that really depends on, and I can speak to this from the making toys side, because I worked in the making toys side and actually I think Sean did as well for many years. Um, that, that tends to be like a chicken or egg question. Are you writing a rule book to sell miniatures or are you writing a rule book to sell a rule book? <laughs> um, because very often it, the, the point of having a miniature company is to sell toy soldiers to sell miniatures. And the rules will be there as a game, obviously, for playing with them. But primarily when a company writes a rule book, it's to, to encourage people to buy the toy soldiers. Um, and so I, I would say that there isn't necessarily pressure in that regard because you're probably not designing something for yourself. You're designing as part of a big collaborative, including the miniature designers and the printers and the casters and the people who are part of this miniature company and the creative director and the creative lead and stuff to write something that complements a miniature range. Um, and I've been through that, that cycle a couple of times where here is X collection of miniatures now write rules for miniatures to make game. Um, and that's not, that's not, not fun, but it's a lot more workmanlike than it is the getting started on game design thing. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a task list more than you're going to have like a creative process because all of X and Y has to be included in this project and we have to write around that. So we're gonna divide up the miniature range into factions and then we're gonna take each faction and see how many SKUs that's gonna be to sell. And then of those miniatures in that faction, how many of them do you wanna sell in each faction? So which ones are gonna be heroes? Which ones are gonna be grunts? That's gonna tell you how many you're gonna produce. And then it's more that kind of formulaic production of a, of, of a game system versus, I have this cool idea for this experience I wanna create. I'm gonna start just writing some words down. That's my, I think, that's my um, two cents on that. 
if if you're trying to get into game design, you're not going to be designing a game for a miniatures line. No. You know, that's you're gonna be hired by a company to write rules, you know, potentially. But if you're saying to yourself, I want to become a game designer, then you need to sit down and design your own game. And <laughs> You know, if you want to end up writing rules for GW or something, you know, then you can show, hey, I've got the experience. I've written this and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, you're not going to just email GW and say, I've got a great idea for a game for some of your rules. They're just not going to listen to that. So one way of looking at it is there are a few companies that will publish miniature agnostic games that you send them. There are basically no companies that will publish your game that you sent them to match their miniatures. I think there's a third, I think a kind of third elusive kind of question that's tied up in this is that maybe you have a crazy imagination and you've kind of thought of something creative that isn't elves and orcs or something. Um, what do you do then? Like, can you come up with the game and have it be crazy and then can I push a, can I push a further to question to that part? actually? Because I, I think this is a great question for Sean. Um, yeah. cause we're, we're getting into chicken and egg stuff. So when Sean, when you wrote sludge, can you tell me the timeline of how that went from idea to art, to toy soldiers, to game? Cause I, I watched that kind of like germinate in your head. And I think it'd be really interesting maybe for people to hear how just in the time when that happened, like you got excited about X, you started making Y, you know what I mean? And just how that, that mm -hmm. led to it, because that to me, maybe kind of answers that question that Joe said of. When people ask us, how do you become a game designer? Well, you just do it, right? Like, you're not going to get hired out of the cold. To, you're not going to get hired out of the cold necessarily to, to write games. You have to write games first. Like, it, how did that happen for you with Sludge? Well, for for Sludge, I wanted to I wanted to do a battle game in like a fantasy guns and knights setting, and uh, and actually that goes back like three years. I I initially had a plan to want to do that and um but managing two ranges of miniatures because i make all the figures and books and products for relic blade i wasn't ready to like a, take on another range of miniatures and so uh i kind of i put that project on the back burner and then um, i saw a bunch of historical miniatures particularly the perry miniatures being used in more of a like creative fantasy way and that, that for me was a big point where I realized like uh, this rule set that I really want to make can be miniatures agnostic. And I think that sort of question about like what, whether your rules should be miniature agnostic or not really plays into whether you have miniatures that you want to make for it or not. And that, and that can go really far where you make all the miniatures for it or for sludge, I'm going as far as making conversion bits to sort of like make those make the plastic ranges that exist in historicals more fantastical make them more fantasy um and and so i just like was overcome with like terrifying creative like energy and like really starting to uh, get into hang on there's some sound anyways um yeah so i was so, sort of overcome by a desire to design and a rule set that I had in mind and, and then uh, was able to write the rules from there. And for me, the like miniature agnostic or not was a big like barrier of permission where I, whether or not I felt like it was worth investing in writing it um, because I'm not crazy about like just miniature agnostic to the point of it's like a, just a rule set that you can use. I'd rather have like a lot of like lore and content to it. You know, like with Frostgrave, it's miniature agnostic in a way. There are Frostgrave miniatures, but the setting is very, very evoked through the whole rule set. And so you never wonder where you are or like what the adventure is or, or what the wizards are like. It's not just like use any figures you want necessarily, even though you can. Like that's not the initial push of it. And so for Sludge, I really, really wanted specific like a uh, dark horror setting and kind of found a workaround for a way to get there. Uh, I, I don't know. I think it, it's interesting. I'm really excited about Sledge. I am. Um, 
I'm working on finishing up the Kickstarter and also working on making sure I'm ready for the launch of Sledge in the next uh, volume of Blaster. And so I've been like assembling a third army for Sludge just the past day or so and having so much fun with uh, Perry French Napoleonics. I got some Hussar miniatures and some 3D printed heads that sort of connect the French figures to uh, like uh, Mobius, Gerard Mobius um, style. And so I'm very, very excited about the whole thing. It's a, it's a creative space I get to like really play with. Uh, I think you actually just brought up a really important point for indie games now. When you're creating rule sets now, um, if you go to a place like myminifig.com or my mini factory, four, my mini factory, uh, my mini factory, yeah, there's thousands of very like thousands and thousands of miniatures that are you know some of them are pretty like analogous to other things on the market, and others are just like insanely cool robots that just don't have a place yet you know so jumping in to write rules and places that you feel inspired around miniatures that you love that don't have a great game uh, is another uh, another way to think about it um and Oops. there's also just like a lot of angles we haven't covered in game in in tabletop war games you know like sean and i were briefly talking about uh i probably shouldn't say that uh so <laughs> self-moderate um but that's just another potential angle is looking around at what inspires you and uh, you know, what new lines are out there and, and writing rules that. Yeah. Like what kind of army do you actually want to build? Like what kind of war band and world do you want to actually play in? Um, Cause I think when we're talking about like writing new rule sets, it, it matters what you like. And also looking at a miniature collection as the like engine for whatever you're going to be playing and so i mean i like to be able to play multiple games with the same figure range i have on my bookshelf right here so. yeah i literally have a carrying case that just says fantasy heroes and fantasy <laughs> monsters in it and i've been writing various things now for that minute those two miniature cases the fantasy monster one's joe's fault because i had to i had 10 10 scenarios of frostgrave first edition i had to make monsters for it and every time we flipped the page i was like i need 10 skeletons what the hell <laughs> and i'm pretty sure most of what's in there is from the various campaign books and i think That's like rpgs right rpgs yeah. do this really well like they're like yeah just use whatever miniature you want and there's no education and no one thinks about that in rpgs either right like, it's it's funny how no one even <laughs> considers like is this an official dungeons and dragons miniature you know what i mean when they're yeah. when they're playing dnd but we're so high hard wild wired and tabletop to be like wait, is, can I use this for this? And, and I'll see Sean on his page just be like, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Like I'd prefer if you bought my <laughs> miniatures, I guess, but there's, a, there's this funny thing. Them? Like I can't, I have this like, like pedantic brain that like I would, when I was a kid, I would never play with my Star Wars toys and my GI Joes at the same time like they didn't <laughs> if i could do something wrong and so like i totally understand wanting to have official miniatures but then also like i mean frostgrave and rangers is a really good example of just being like joe just expects you to have any <laughs> like the uh social he'll, he'll just be like oh no there's flies and you're like what <laughs> where do i have flies like <laughs> well, I, I don't know i think that also gave me permission to just be like don't limit your imagination based on what figures exist, but also like be ready to, yeah, just be ready to like create what is, what is right. And people yeah. will be able to fill in the gaps and, you know, people can use bats if they don't have flies, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't super I mean? matter. Yeah. yeah. People can use fraud goblins if they don't have gnolls, which is what I did yeah. for most of Rangers of Shadow Deep. <laughs> yeah. I happen to use a bunch of pigmen instead of gnolls. Yeah, exactly. We have a couple um, more questions coming in. I, I do want to get uh, Mike. Mike's perspective on this question is pretty important, I think, as well. Um, can we come back to the getting started, too? Because I think we're, we're veering a little bit off the how do you get started and what's a process like for writing, sure. and I want to make sure that we keep to the, the topic. Oh, okay. The topic. Cool. Are we doing that? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Mike, do you want to jump in? Do you want to do you want to talk will, about your process and how you yeah. get started? Mike, let's let, Mike, let's convert this into a combo question because <laughs> this will be a, a, a fantastic segue. Okay, so here's your combo question: yeah. When you sat down to start a specific game, perhaps a game with toy cars that get converted, yeah. um, like how did that? How was the how was the effect of like there being no miniatures for you when you started? Like, how did that affect your, your game design? I, I think that it's, for, for me, it's like, I'm an obsessional collector of miniatures from all locations. And I am the kind of person who will buy miniatures, even though I have no game plan for them. And so um, I, for some reason, had some drop zone commander, like, I just had these little battle buses, because like, these are the cutest little things i've ever seen i just need to paint them and so the first games of gaslands we just played with drop zone commando battle buses tootling around on my uh, on my dining room table and it's sort of the same with perilous tales like perilous tales exists because i love buying little lovecraftian pulp miniatures and there wasn't a way to play with them on my own so i just wrote a solo game of of sort of horror uh, of horror uh, unfolding scenarios and i think that's that's one of a couple of ways I get in, like either I'm inspired by some toy soldiers and I want them to do the thing that I want them to do. And I haven't found the way to do that, partly because I'm too lazy to, to necessarily learn all the other games. And the second thing is, I think Ash sort of mentioned this before in some other places, like I'll have... I'll encounter something awesome in a film or in a TV show or in a video game. And I'll just be like, no, oh, that's so good. I want to, I want to express that in my medium. And so it will take a moment, like, like the billion suns broadly speaking came out of that bit in rogue one where the rebels are about to escape in their spaceships from a planet. And then like, a Star Destroyer turns up like right in the middle of everything and so close to everything that like some Corvettes just like splat on it like bugs on a windshield. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. Why doesn't that happen in any tabletop games? I want to write a spaceship game that does that. So those are my two routes in is basically the miniatures or some cinematic image that needs to, needs to happen. Sweet. That's awesome. And I love that scene too. And can't wait to play a billion suns. Is that sucker still coming out? It's coming out in two weeks, 18th of February. Weeks. Really There'll be a video on the 18th as well. Hooray! Hey! Nice. Yeah. I, I, it's convenient. I was painting all those aliens miniatures, and, and you sent me some miniatures that kind of look like the Sulaco. So I was just like, well, you know, Wayland Yutani sounds like a good corporation name for my my, my fleet for a billion suns. Yeah, so. Indeed. I'm just saying space krakens might have some some um, morphology that's slightly alien like uh, in my my billion Sweet. sons campaign. Yeah, Sweet. there's going to be some evil corporations, some evil Lance Henriksons walking around. The the other thing the other thing actually is I have this I have a a number of these ring bound books uh, um, notebooks. I found this notebook kind that I really like writing on, and so I have a bunch of these. And so these are filled with um, just bits where something inspires me and I will spend no more than a page just getting excited about that topic and then having written some scrappy notes to myself I'll just get on with the rest of my life and so there's a game idea in here that I'm so, I've picked up again recently the last page I wrote on whilst I was listening to Ash be interviewed about Gamma Worlds I was writing a page to the last written page called Afterburner Modern Jet Combat and I've been scratching my head about how to make jets work on a table because like as soon as they start moving they're they're off you have the to table. make them the size of a pinhead. That's all you have to do. It's just the, <laughs> exactly. the miniatures are truly miniature. The Gasland templates are your table. <laughs> exactly. Wait, and this is like the fifth time I've just written like one page, and that game still hasn't emerged yet. But I'll just keep writing single broken pages of a game until it speaks enough to me. That's a good getting started note segue to, and I think Joe was about to say something. You triggered something in him. What were you I, I just want to know what his notebooks are. <laughs> what, what brand? I'm, you I'm just an obsessive UK. notebook buyer, so I want to know what. Uh... Yeah, so there's, some very, there's some very colorful square paper. Square paper is very important because then you can draw diagrams with the little color sections well, that I don't use, but they're from graph paper. paper. He's using graph paper. Mm -hmm. 
yeah and all of all of my a4 pads are graph paper as well actually i think it's something to do with yeah square paper and graph paper and for those of you in north america a4 is what the rest of the world uses instead of letter because letter is stupid <laughs> Funny story. <laughs> kind of I miss letters. I know letter you miss. Of course, you miss letter. You miss everything. You miss everything. Funny story about that, Ash. <laughs> Somebody once made the first issue of <laughs> Blaster in A4, right? And then the night before release, relayed it out as eight and a half by eleven. <laughs> The, the, like, the beginning of that, the beginning of that, really made me chuckle because you because uh, I'm sitting here with a bunch of Americans and one of them goes, I'm not "Yeah, here. we should put it on A4 because that's really sexy." And I'm like, "There's nothing sexy about A4." Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> it's a good, it's an actual. It's so tall and elegant. Don't get me started, and I'm very disappointed. It's the Ferrari like of, of paper layouts, just so you know. That's the <laughs> <laughs> we're using good old General Motors eight and a half by eleven here in North America. Like, like thank you. <laughs> With uh, one like inch, Henry Ford intended. <laughs> one inch rule, so you can get your letters real big. That's right. Uh, I, can, I don't. I don't like none of this fancy cursive. How about uh, Mike? I like your low key. T-Rex there. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm uh Keep it I'm down. Not, I wasn't I wasn't on screen, so you couldn't see the low-key T-Rex. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Uh <laughs> so kind of going back, I thought that was really interesting, both for Sludge and for Gaslands to kind of hear what about origin, like origin stories of some of our games. Um you know, I, I think it's it's safe to say we know that we're inspired by you know, these cinematic moments or things that kind of capture our imagination. But are there any like um, interesting memories you have about, you know, like what really pushed you to release one of your games or like that moment of this is, I'm doing this even for the first time. I think Sean with Relic Blade, uh, you had some drawings and, and Ash, I'm sure it'd be interesting to hear about. I actually got rejected by Osprey. <laughs> <laughs> the first time Osprey did, story. I can my, Joe, Joe likes this story. Um, so, so my first attempt at doing a miniature game was in 2009, and I'd written Last Days in a very different way, actually. Um, while I was driving, I wrote it mostly in my head, actually, a bit, a bit like, uh, a bit like Mike was talking about with the notebooks. I used to drive a ton for work. We, we didn't have the money in, in, um, in the business to be flying everywhere. So I was driving like four or five hours to go and, and, and um, do meetings and stuff. And during these long drives, I would literally, I would stop into like game stores in the cities I'd visit and buy random miniatures. And I was buying all these hassle-free miniatures. And that's how I ended up with this like modern adventure kind of collection. And last days was literally just me sitting in my car, driving for like five hours, you know, one way to go to a meeting. And looking over at the bag of miniatures I just bought and be like, oh, I wonder what I could use that guy for. And, and writing a game in my head. And then I'd sit in my hotel room at night and, and like bang out like two or three pages of like, here's an idea of like what I might do. And that eventually formed together into the first version of Last Days, which funnily enough, when you first start writing a miniature game, and this is something that I talked about when I did the notes for the second version of Last Days, which got published, you tend to be very, without even being conscious, I found I was being very uh, derivative of uh, games that I'd played. Not necessarily in like stealing rules or mechanics and stuff like that, but like in the way the book was laid out, in the way that I introduced factions and stuff. And the original version of Last Days was basically just Necromunda with zombies. <laughs> like, and like a, and a zombie face. Like it wasn't, it wasn't interesting or different because it didn't feel like a zombie movie. It felt like I was just writing kind of a boilerplate war game. And around 2010, when it was mostly done and we played it a bunch, and we had fun with it because I mean, there was nothing like it. So we still enjoyed it and it was familiar. Um, but I don't think it was anything special. Uh, there was a call out from Osprey for submitting. They were like, we're looking for independent game designers. We'll, we'll publish your game. Like, I don't know. I don't know what this one page was, but it basically got published on Tabletop Gaming News. And I sent the manuscript in. And I got a reply back about a week and a half later, I think from Phil, actually, <laughs> that, said, that said, your game is very derivative of Warhammer games and we're not looking for another Mordheim. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then Frostgrave got published like five years later. And I was like, what? He settled like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I knew it my <laughs> but, but that like getting started process, uh, just to kind of like dovetail into um, 
everybody else's like uh, kind of experience. Yeah. It, it's it's usually kicked off by the the something, you know what I mean, the inspirational moment, and then it's followed by kind of a like scrabbling where you're like, ah, here's an idea. Like an idea will kind of like get picked out of the air and you'll write it down, you'll jot it down and it'll be a mess for a little while. Um, and your first try is probably not going to be very good and it's not going to feel like anything um, or it's, it's not going to, it's going to, you're going to think it's great, but it's not going to be anything that you haven't already played before. Or anybody else probably hasn't already played before. And eventually the process of writing for me, once you're started is about shaping all of that. And I usually take the mess later on and I start a whole new document and that shaping process is whole new document. And then just two or three pages of bullet points of all like the section headers for what I think should still be in there. And then I just start scalping out from this huge messy document chunks that work to kind of fill in the, the bullet points. And then my workflow becomes going and filling in the rest. Right. So I have this huge list of just bold section headers where I know in my head what needs to go in there and the bits that are working for my big rough brain explosion draft get like dragged out of there to save some time. And then I'll just reshape the paragraphs or reshape the wording or whatever, if it doesn't quite work. And then that skeleton that you put together afterwards becomes your actual like workflow template for like really writing the game. And that's what happened with second edition last days, which was the one that got published in, when was that now? 28, 17, 18, 17. 18. I can't remember. Anyway, that, that was me taking that first version that I wrote, chopping it into a bunch of pieces, deciding the parts I liked, which were things like the stat lines and the turn structure and like the action points and stuff like that. And then just using that skeleton and hanging the actual game I wanted to make on top of it, which was about people and the way they relate to each other and all the zombie movie stuff that when I took it apart and I looked at it, was the thing that was really inspiring me to write a zombie movie game. It wasn't writing rules. Rules are boring. <laughs> it was about it was about making something that felt like you were surviving the zombie apocalypse. Yeah, and I think that I think that's that's a really great breakdown because I do that sort of same process where I'll like be answering questions and solving, making solutions, coming to like various formulas for the way game mechanics will break down, and then uh, and then also by moving that document aside and starting again, you're able to like reapproach it and see if you went this way to figure out like way a roundabout way that made sense at the time to make a certain dice roll or mechanic work that you can like create shortcuts and, and like cut the fat a lot faster. If you aren't actively having to delete paragraphs from the original document to cut the fat, yeah. but rather you're like redoing reimagining the the mechanics as they're meant to be in a format that has like the bullet points that are the skeleton if you ever or want to see great general specific i think that's a really good uh like practical thing people if you ever want to see a really good book on that process uh there's two that i really recommend one is actually go and buy a copy of, if you can find it anymore of um jervis johnson's epic armageddon because it's actually written if you go to the index all of the section titles are written in a 1.0, 1.1, 1.1.1. 1 .1. He's written it as a workflow document. And then the second one is go write a how to write workflow documents for dummies. Because the, the skeleton of a workflow document, and for those watching who don't know what that is, that's usually what gets used in technical jobs. Like if you're an IT technician or you're doing some kind of like process driven thing, where like, like, like um, network infrastructure, or whatever you have to do X before you can do Y. And so they make this huge like task chart of you go through these things in these order to resolve something. Well, that's just game design. You're the human computer doing that process, right? And so when you're writing a game using that process, Jervis has this wonderful, clean game in Epic Armageddon because he follows that kind of thing. And you can see he's written it that way when you look at the book. It's one of those funny things when I buy real books now, I actually almost tend to look more about how they're laid out and how they're written than I do like the story or the background or stuff like that. Like I break into like that, like that, like chunky stuff, but yeah, no, there's a lot of in common with like clean game design and hang that skeleton with um, doing like task oriented, um, like uh, workflow sheets and stuff like that in business, which is really funny because you'd think they have nothing in common. One's boring and one's fun, but it's actually just, you're making uh, rules in a game or just a job list of things to do. 
it's a funny story uh my my career began as a business analyst so my entire job was writing workflow documents to explain how businesses function and yes you're exactly right it turns out that's basically the skill set required to write games mine too <laughs> it's <laughs> funny <laughs> quick moment to talk about the importance of oh, art and graphic design in games would be uh if you got these documents as word documents as i get them you'd be like oh. but it's funny because each one of these guys sends them to me and it's just like they're describing it's like you i'll be scanning through like the preview rules and it'll be like add morale rules here and there's no like it's just like i know that there will be morale checks however I don't know how it's going to work. So I'll just put a note, morale later. <laughs> Leave two thirds like, of an inch of page for morale checks. <laughs> so kind of thinking thinking about the game design from that level and we're looking at this, this flow, are you, are you going through and getting that all organized and done before you play test your first game? Or are you breaking up those sections and play testing parts and remixing and rematching? Like how do you approach experiencing your game once you've first you know like got started on some good chunks of rules the engine's usually not more than like an eighth of a rule book though like the core engine of like how you move how you go around doing stuff how you be david from prometheus and just go touch everything till it explodes like isn't usually more than like an eighth of the actual book it's usually the 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 world that is all of that writing so that tends to happen pretty fast and you just kind of have to hit the road with it and see if it functions versus like trying to get that perfect that's my experience i don't know how everybody else feels about that i'll test like a mechanic or things separate from a full game for sure mm -hmm. uh especially i mean i really don't want i i really genuinely believe that how you do stuff shouldn't be the co overly complicated and like and the rules for shooting a gun shouldn't take longer than it would take to shoot a gun yeah that's a good <laughs> the distance. rules for swinging a sword shouldn't take longer to figure out the hits and bonuses and and debuffs and all of that stuff shouldn't take longer than it would to like swing a sword around so we, um, we can I'll, do a whole episode on that whole simulation yeah. versus uh but like game. <laughs> i think i think for for me i'll run through play testing or like rolling dice or setting up encounters or whatever to do um, to get that general stuff down. But, um, but man, like even scenarios, you'll get funny stuff. If you don't play test, you can think, you know, what is happening and then be like, Oh, this little clause makes it. So you always lose or this little detail is like totally, totally ruins it. And so like play testing is extremely important. It's, like extremely important and and continuing to do it each step of the way i think assume you've missed something. even if you just are playing <laughs> like it's a by yourself yeah, yeah it's that's... not necessarily a massive like play testing group needs to go through it but you gotta like you have to try everything yeah just try it at least yeah. otherwise there is always an unintended consequence in almost everything you do it's there you, you're even if the machine's super simple there's going to be something where if you do something too many times it's as bad as not doing something enough um and that can be in like your group design or something like that you have to watch it for skews that's a big thing where i find that the little bit of testing really helps like can someone just take too many of these and then they just win and there's nothing anybody can do or uh is this adding value in a way that i that is is way too good for whatever the consequence of taking it is I, I found that it's actually very useful to wrap your head around things too, to have physical objects in front of you. So like when I was running Gamma Wolves, we, we ordered a bunch of Lego mechs from Amazon, Owen and I did, and just like put together Lego in like 15, 20 minutes and then stuck them on bases just so we'd have visual re representations and just threw pools of dice at each other. We didn't have any rules for it. We just came up with like general templates for it. They didn't even have stats. It was just a three plus four plus five plus for these dice pools and we moved them around the table back and forth. And that was good enough to test out the engine just to see if the mechanically it functions where two players have an equal chance of like moving around and it doesn't, it doesn't just fall apart and fall off the cliff like right away. Mm -hmm. Joe, I want to make sure I'm not, or Julie, I want to make sure I'm not leaving you out. Um, you've been so quiet. Yeah, Do you have yeah. any thoughts on? I mean, what it felt so breaking up and testing a singular like 
set of mechanic or do you are do you kind of pretty disciplinedly get through the whole disciplinedly <laughs> it, it depends on what i'm writing if like people are talking about actually creating an entire rule book so you're starting with fresh mechanics i will pound those you know i will write like this is what combat looks like and then i will just start rolling d10s and d20s for hours and just you know does this work okay and then you can when you start adding on and then you know, your iterate, you know, the iterative process, it just, it, it, it gets like, it gets easier once you start like adding, you know, slights, you know, you, you'll develop one faction, fight that against itself. And, you know, overall, that's my, <laughs> that's a good way of saying I don't have a really particularly complicated process for it. I, I mean, I was trying to figure, wrap my head, you guys have been very inspiring to work with and I was kind of trying to make some mechanics of my own. And I was sitting there with, you know, a couple of minis different distances away from each other. And I was like, which one looks the coolest? And like, how do you like, when you pick up the dice, what feels right? You know, like with mystic skies, you get sweet Gaslands vibes, but you get heaps of dice like fantasy. So there's like, it has this, it has this feeling of like you're playing a fantasy combat game, but it also has the the vibes of Gaslands. So I thought, I think you can get kind of, uh, you can almost communicate the, another, it's another potential place for you to communicate the flavor of your game. And I think for your game, uh, Joey, like the D10s is just like the right thing. Like it's a little, it's not quite D20. It's not quite D6. It's just a little bit, a little bit quirky, just like a horse spider. You know, it's kind of. Anyway. We should do an episode on dice, on on selecting dice and and who what, what dice is best. Because I think we could all argue about that for a while. <laughs> like, I honestly think it would just be a belligerent fight. Like it wouldn't even be. It would end all of our friendships if we talked about dice. Probably. <laughs> Everyone oh, knows you in favor of the D four. It's coin flips. That's right. It's uh, rock paper war scissors. Game. Just, I'm gonna do my rock paper scissors resolution war game. Is what's gonna happen. It's all one two three shoots. <laughs> Joe, Joey, sorry. Can I, can I ask you about about how you came to this? Is not a test because the one thing that I loved about your game when you first uh, got in touch with me, like, and this is five, six years ago now was you, I could feel you and your friends and your gaming group in that game. Like it, how, how did it come about? Like how did writing a post-apocalyptic Maryland game take place? You know what I mean? With like Johnny atomic and all of this, like dramatis person, a, who are your buddies that you put into it? Like, I, I want to hear a little bit about that because you've clearly taken a rich gaming life that you've had in Maryland. And like, I'm people who wouldn't know, you probably don't know that that's kind of like, like written into the sauce in your game, but it really is. Where'd that come from? Uh, you have to, <laughs> you kind of have to, it, it, if you had, you kind of have to come from a town, it's, it's town based. Like, yeah. so I'm from a town in Maryland called Cumberland. It's called Cumberland. And if like, I, I think it's true of any small town that you treat it as the center of the universe and whatever small claim to fame you have, that's important. We like to talk about that. We were bigger than the, bigger than the city of Baltimore for a time. We were the queen <laughs> city ago. of Maryland. It was called, <laughs> we, you know, it, there's just, there's like this weird amount of pride that you come for, for your hometown. And I was like, you know, I wanted to write a Necromunda a game. I wanted to write, I was playing Fallout 3 at the time. I was like, oh my God, I need to do this in miniatures. I need to do this. And then, it, but it all was like the, the spine of the game was, can I do this in Cumberland? And the reason why the, the, I, I, I thought I could get away with it is because Cumberland's not a big city. Right. So I don't have to worry about all the stuff like try, I don't have to figure out this massive topography of what that whole city is doing. It's in the middle of nowhere, but it's in between a lot of places. Mm -hmm. It's also surrounded by it for a generally flat state. It's it's situated in the Apple in, in the Appalachian Mountains, so it's surrounded by three mountains. So if if there's going to be anything that survives in Maryland, it will be the one place right. that has semi-safe and it's close to things it's almost like it's this perfect distance from everything so i just thought it's like the perfect place to set a, 
that type of war game. And, you know, it's, 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 ba- it's, it's baked in. Like you can really feel it. Yeah. When you look at the maps and you see that stuff. Like, and, and some people probably, probably don't know that about the game, but how did that, like, how did that energize you to do it? Is that the thing that like pushed you over the edge to, to making it? Was it that like, you know, this would be so cool if it was here. Cause it's so perfect. Like, is that imagination thing that actually like got you to, to, to hit the keyboard and start typing? I, I, think, I, I think it wasn't so much. Or is that what got it, kept it rolling? Maybe it was, that was what I was going to say. It's, it wasn't the Genesis. Mm-hmm. It was the spirit that kept it going. Mm. Like when you're like, okay, I've written my rules. What do I want to do? And then I was like, then you're like, okay, now what would this, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's just, then you just start thinking of all these crazy ideas. And you know, for the most part, I wasn't trying to write a war game lore. I wasn't trying to write a games workshop background. It was just more of like, this is kind of my idea. If i if someone was going to write an RPG for the post apocalypse, but it was miniature based, and I was going to write my own fan supplement, this is what it would look like. This mm-hmm. is what how I would do it. And I thought, I'm the rules writer. I'm paying for the art. Mm-hmm. I'm the guy in charge. It's the beautiful thing about running your own war games is mm-hmm. I'm going to go ahead and make this fan supplement to the official background. Perfect. That's perfect. And and that, so that, yeah, that was kind of what I did with it, and that kept it going. Yeah, that does help keep it going. I I found that I'm I'm often more excited about writing a supplement that, than I am a game. Once I have yeah. the game like baked down, you know what I mean. Like I like exploring the next little corner of what I've done, and sometimes I'll actually. I'll write a game because I want to write a supplement. Like the game I'm working on right now, I'm actually more excited about writing all of the stuff to do scenarios for the game <laughs> than I am even necessarily about writing the core mechanics for the game. But that's pulling me through writing all the core mechanics and the and the character yeah. creation and stuff for the game and keeping me going. Because it's easy to like, raise your hand if you've gotten an idea and you've stalled out like halfway through writing the core rules for a game. <laughs> but, I mean, it's, it's writing what, you, you know, for me, it's right. It was kind of a combination of, writing what you know so like i know the intimate details of where i'm from so if i if i need to pigeonhole something in there i've like i know i know immediately it's like when you were doing your initial videos you did the nickel city stories yeah, yeah. i was all based on that area you knew yeah. and that's one of the why the niagara or the what was it i called the great lakes wasteland yeah, yeah it was the great like, the great lakes wasteland all around this this area people are like i need florida and i'm like man i'm not from florida <laughs> Like well, I you should make Florida. Like that's the thing is like I, I think that's part of the joy though too is I got that out of the book where I felt like you'd really explain this area. And so when I started making videos, I was like, well, I'm just gonna set it where I live because that's that's perfect. And then yeah. I can have all these locations and landmarks and stuff be the setting for my game, and I'll take these factions and we'll have mm-hmm. them, you know, roaming through and stuff. And 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 that to me is that's really interesting. I think that's when you get excited about writing right at the beginning, especially. Uh, I tend to now look for why am I excited about this? If I can set this in my hometown, someone else might really like doing that too. And then that gets me more excited because I can see that, like that potentiality, you know what I mean? Where someone else could take this thing I'm writing and get excited about their hometown or get excited about their giant robots or get excited about, you know, their fishmen or their like ancient elder root Renaissance Napoleonic armies or like, <laughs> what, <laughs> whatever yeah, that ends I, up I think, being. I think it's uh talking about what's exciting like it matters so much to to recognize that like core rules don't make a game like core mechanics don't make a game like how you swing a sword doesn't make an adventure uh you know what i mean like how you shoot a gun doesn't make star wars so um so it's not that it's all lore based and but but that the whole thing is like a whole storytelling medium that we get to really engage with. And I think it's interesting because I've been reflecting on it more lately that this whole like making models and rules and, and like bits of lore rather than a whole novel where you have like the characters and story built in and you tell the whole story, but that I really felt invited to be part of the world when I was reading RPG supplements or reading that stuff and engaging with worlds in a totally different way where I felt like I was a participant uh, through gaming and like through video games and through miniature games and miniatures. It's like, it's a totally new way for me to do it because, and it's also very native to me that I, uh, 
I loved exploring the worlds of Warhammer fantasy by reading the books and gluing together the figures and playing in that universe. And so I think that's part of it, like being an independent designer, I'm, I'm putting all these elements that like stack up kind of like dominoes next to each other, where you've got core rules and you've got art and you've got uh, setting and lore, and then hopefully a player will start exploring those and the whole thing will topple on each other and create an inspiration in them to like string the whole story together and, and engage in it and create their own uh, universe because because rules writing isn't just about making mechanics or rather what, what I think we're doing as independent game designers. So we aren't just making it so people can roll dice if they want. It's more a whole thing a whole hobby and a whole way of imagining these stories that really we found ourselves native to this world because we read so many D and D and rifts supplements when we were young and read so many novels, but then also the figures and it all like tied into this like complicated imagination in these like smoky game stores. I so, can definitely, I I think that that metagame thing that you're talking about where people don't just roll dice, where there's this whole start, middle and end. That's a, that's a whole episode. I think we could definitely do a whole episode on like just the, the culture that comes out of what you've done after you write a game, because it's funny after you've written a game, you almost have more work if it's successful than you did writing the game because you have to upkeep this, this culture that you've now you've built like in your Facebook groups with thousands of people potentially asking you questions or showing off the things they've made or, you know, like um, running into issues with something you've done. And there's this whole, like, there's this whole living body of people now all of a sudden experience doing that experience you're talking about where they're collecting miniatures and making their own war bands and, you know, making their own robots or their cars or whatever. And it takes on a life of its own. And it's something you can't make happen writing a miniature game, but it's certainly something you can aspire to have happen is that whole big experience. You're, you're, you're right. That's kind of, that's kind of a, a follow-up topic. C coming back to the getting started. Uh, we haven't heard much from Joe. Uh, McCulloch, do you, do you like the bit where you're initially having the idea and it's all potential more, or do you like the development bit where something is sort of growing a number of legs and starting to work? Or do you like the bit where you're kind of polishing and making it glorious? Um, the middle bit. <laughs> so like the initial, there's so many initial ideas that actually it's like hard to choose one, you know, it's so there's actually kind of a stress to that part. It's like, oh, do I write this game or do I write that one? But I like, once I've, I've fixed that, the kind of, for me, the best part is the actual putting words on page. Um, I probably, maybe I'm a little different from you guys in that I kind of think of myself as a writer more than a game designer, even, even as I'm probably known more as a game designer. But for me, the, the time I get into the flow is that actual typing on a computer and writing and, it's those ideas developing as I write the words. And one of the reasons I like tend to keep background light in my game, it's partly intentional design to, to allow the players more access, but it's also because I want to leave myself as much room as possible to create as I go along. So if, you know, I'm writing Ranges of Shadow Deep and I think, you know what, I really need a city to sit here. Blam, I'll just put a city there, you know, and I like to to world build and game build as I go along. Um, I'm not somebody who wants to sit down and define everything ahead of time. So it's it's that being in it and um, the polishing is actually the part I hate. Like, <laughs> I hate, I hate editing. I hate, like, uh, I was going to say earlier with like Oathmark, when I was working on that, I ended up writing the line of sight rules something like 14 or 15 different times because, you know, just every time I wrote it, somebody would come back with a, yeah, but what if I'm standing on a mountain under a tree, you know, while it's raining? And I'm just like, oh, and, you know, part of you wants to go, I just don't care, you know? I don't <laughs> care, man. Fix it yourselves. Exactly. Just, this just, is just, case just be, one. Keys would be great if there were any players. 
There's a rule in Gaslands called final position, which is the bit where you push the toy car along the template and maybe it bumps into something. And I wrote that like 400 times mm -hmm. because the actual <laughs> rule is push it along the template making car noises. And if it crashes into something, you know what it does. Of course, you're <laughs> writing it out. It's, it's as fiddly as line of sight. It's exactly mm -hmm. that. I also like the optimize for maximum carnage aspect of that. I think that's a cool, yes. you know. Air on the side of carnage, yeah. Always air on the side of carnage. On the side if, of carnage. if it makes the if it makes the car explode, then that's what the rule says. Yeah, that was that was one of the most genius cop outs in game design I've ever seen in my entire life. I don't want to answer any questions about blowing up. If you're gonna blow up, that's what happens. <laughs> if you might blow up, you blow up. I I I should have stolen that for like a hundred different projects. It's my favorite thing ever. So I think we have emerged. Um, many different topics that we're going to be wanting to cover and we're going to invite you guys along the way um as we as we cover those topics the one thing i think um that could help you in starting your game uh you know from a creative writing standpoint is this idea of a uh of a crucible like what keeps your characters there but in game design you don't have a character right uh, ash and Joey and Sean are creating these worlds and, and Mike and Joe as well are creating these worlds that players play the game in. So, but what keeps them on the table? I feel like in last days it's picking up supplies and trying to get something on the, off the table. That's something that makes me want to be on, like, that's what makes them stay there or in Frostgrave, same thing. It's like looting this ancient magical city with, uh, you know, magical artifacts and things in it. The whole, yeah, that stop. whole concept. <laughs> cracker Jacks. It's all Cracker Jacks. <laughs> it's what? Cracker Jacks. Give me those Cracker Jacks. I don't know what's in the box. Give me the toy. It's the free toy you get. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Did, did I just really date, jacks. did Joe and I just really date ourselves with Cracker Jacks? Did no one else get? <laughs> no? I, right. I got it. <laughs> I I don't, thank you, Sean. Also, thank like, you. That's so exciting about that game. Like, wait. Now, now we get to open all the toys we found. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Free stuff. So there's the Cracker Jacks aspect, but, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I at the time I grew up, we had evolved better candies uh, than Cracker Jack. Um, well, the European version is the Kinder Surprise, which we all know is illegal to bring to America, so you wouldn't have experienced it. <laughs> It's like, because a kid's going to eat the bottom of it? What? <laughs> That's actually the reason. Too many kids yeah. might choke on the toy on the inside. Kids were swallowing the egg on the inside. You'd have to because American eat children don't <laughs> chew. They just go, ah, like a duck. <laughs> it takes sucking eggs, Look at the capsules. Like, <laughs> I, like, I just killed Mike. I, really, I just killed Mike. He had to mute his mic because he's laughing too hard. No, that was literally a thing. I got in trouble once for bringing a Kinder Surprise egg home. Uh, <laughs> In like I didn't know because I was it's from so American kid just I had no like idea. This. I brought I brought one home for, for yeah, I brought one home from the UK and I got stopped at customs being like, sir, you can't bring this to the country. This is you dangerous. And I'm I like, what? That? <laughs> you know how I, I buy these kinder surprise? Yeah, no kinder surprise it's, it's the toy looks exactly well not the toy, the kinder egg itself looks exactly like a like a fat boy or uh, like a, a fat man or little boy <laughs> a nuclear, nuclear weapon. bomb. So all these people <laughs> yeah. in Europe. We're making these awesome little bombs, like unexploded bombs for TNT. We're like, mm -hmm. where are you getting that? Like, they're kind of like, what is that? And then I'm like, oh, shit, they're right. We are not getting this. <laughs> <laughs> Joey, I can mail you a box of them. My kids throw away about 100 of them a lot, okay. like a year. <laughs> I, can, I can see I Ash coming now. through customs with, like, 50 replica swords and one like kinder egg. <laughs> I've got Narsal <laughs> and kinder egg and they're yelling about the kinder egg. That's the best part. Oh, yeah. yeah that's the they're like, sir, this AR-15, it's fine. Just like, just bring <laughs> it on board with you. It's just roll it up in your sleeping bag. It'll be fine. Uh, but that kinder egg. <laughs> that's right. Sir, that's dangerous. You need to be responsible. Have to, uh, put it in All right. Well, guys, thank you so much. Um, We'll be back on, we'll always be doing on, I think Mondays um, around the same time, but the intermittency and how, how many we're going to schedule will be released later. Um, this will be available for um, viewing later um, on YouTube via Gorilla Miniature Games, as well as in a podcast form, I believe, yep. uh, Ash. Yeah, it'll be available on Spotify uh, podcasts. I. For some reason, I still am not approved on Apple Podcasts, but we'll see about fixing that at some point. 
probably because of this, this oh, terrible, rude things, terrible but... content. Yeah, my terrible offensive content about game design. If, um, <laughs> if you're listening right now in the future on Spotify with no video, I want you to know that this whole time that Mike Hutchinson has been wearing a Wayne's World hat and has been sculpting a custom dinosaur with guns on it. That's the kind of group that you're listening to right now. <laughs> These are the kind of people we associate yeah. with. And, and man, Mike and drinking marshmallow that. flavored beer. Yeah. Also, I don't think anyone else. Is that what it is? That. Yeah, <laughs> it's marshmallow <laughs> stout. Just, just doing it here. <laughs> is it called marshmallow stout? Yeah, it's called layer cake, and it is a marshmallow and chocolate stout, and it is just it's it's just good it's It's made with pure daniel craig that's the name we couldn't remember earlier (laughs) (laughs) all right guys thanks for watching we'll see you next time thanks for tuning in checking out today's let's talk game design now if you have ideas for topics that uh, me and the blaster crew could discuss put them down in the comments below and let us know what you thought about this episode uh and any of your thoughts on the topics that we talked about thanks for watching we'll see you next time for the let's talk till then i'm ash how programming (laughs) 